The following is a special presentation of National Geographic on Assignment. You will not be able to stay home, brother. You will not be able to plug in, turn on, and cop out. You will not be able to lose your for a year and a half, the, uh, the city had been gripped by a civil war that had killed 30,000, mainly civilian people. The revolution will not be televised. The revolution will not be brought to you by Xerox in four parts without commercial interruptions. The famine was in full swing. The revolution will not go better with coke. The revolution will not fight germs that may cause bad breath. The revolution will put you in the driver's seat. The and the warlords were in control. The revolution will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised, will not be televised. The revolution will be no rerun, brothers. The revolution will be live. On July 12, 1993, there was a terrible bombing by UN forces of a house where they suspected the warlord General Idid was hiding. Journalists rushed to the scene. Four of them murdered that day by an angry mob. The call came at seven in the morning and I was asleep in Los Angeles. I was in a hotel. I was working in Mexico. I was doing an internship. I was at home convalescing from a road accident. We said, oh no, oh no, no, no. And I knew. You know, I knew instantly. I said, it's Dan, isn't it? And my mother called and said, you know, this is the phone call I never wanted to make, and, and Dan's been killed. He was only 22, a photographer whose pictures had made time and Newsweek. Dan Eldon lived for adventure. And that's the thing, at some level, I don't know. I, it's almost like he knew he didn't have much time. But much of Dan's story remains to be told. He left behind 17 journals, extraordinary documents, pages brimming with life. A few years after Dan was killed, Kathy decided to publish her son's journals in a book called The Journey is the Destination. Since then, she's received thousands of letters and artwork from people around the world, all with the same message. Dan's spirit has changed their lives. This is a room we've dedicated to Dan, and we put a camera on this wall and we put sheer above it. And that's what we thought Dan did with the world. He really has been kind of the flame under me saying, just go do it. If you have it in your heart and it's in your mind, then push forward, follow that dream. There have always been in my life certain people that inspired me, but I believe that Dan had inspired me more than anyone. And I also wrote to Kathy Eldon. I was so moved by her son's journals I want to find out who Dan Eldon really was and why he affected so many people. <laughs> My first stop, meeting his sister Amy <laughs> and his mother Kathy. Now you're finally seeing us at home. So this is an exactly kind of an airtight, secure area. Um, and it's funny because when he was alive, we'd just sort of throw them in the back of a Land Rover. And now he's no longer around. They're so precious. Morning, morning, lovely morning. He was born in London, but grew up in Kenya. In front of us, the Ngong Hills, the biggest, bumpiest hills in Africa. For me, it was like walking into a Technicolor dream. Here in Nairobi, Dan and his best friend, his little sister Amy, 
explored the biggest backyard they had ever seen. Wow. I think I, I had the most incredible upbringing and childhood there because um, there's um, a sense of freedom and space and community. We didn't have television, we didn't have videos, we didn't have computers, we didn't have any of the stuff. So it was very simple so kids become very creative. The expeditions were endless. From early on, Dan captured them with his camera. At 13, he went on a class trip and had to keep a journal. Right then, it was clear. Dan saw the world in his own way. And his book was a little different than other people's books. It had things added, you know, and the, around the margins, and less writing and a lot more stuff. So I think that just really set him off on the possibility of recording your life as art. Their generator was broken, so I had to do my homework with a lantern. What began as a class assignment grew into a passion. Robert Norton is a childhood friend. I just remembered how worked they were and how layered they were and that the spines were sort of like that, so that they were just sort of falling out in terms of all the things that he'd shoved in there. And they'd be like kind of, you know, little bits of, I don't know, lizard skin or like people's hair. They were just kind of spilling out of life. Another childhood friend, Jeff Gettleman, now reports for the New York Times. He would spend hours, you know, bent over those scrapbooks. I mean, hours. I remember looking through them, just thinking like there is this, you know, like inside this guy, there must be these enormous forces clashing to sort of produce, you know, these really sort of dramatic, uh, in some ways dark uh, journals. It wasn't something, you know, like how people have journals and they just shove in the photos and they write down, you know, I was sick today, food poisoning. Dan's weren't like that. Dan's were just um, kind of a tremendous, like, recording. And, um, you know, those, they left you speechless. Like a strange omen, Dan Eldon's obsession with death would lead him down an unexpected path to a brutal destiny. Opening up the journals, a whole universe pours out. His journeys in his Land Rover Desiree. His humor. Please don't look at this photo and want to slowly remove the cloth. And Dan Eldon's take on life. mission statement for safari as a way of life. To explore the unknown and the familiar, distant and near, and to record with the eyes of a child any beauty of the flesh or otherwise, horror, irony, traces of utopia, or hell. When Dan was 17, he was chased by a buffalo and almost killed. The buffalo became an image that would haunt him. They pound after me. I have lost a flip-flop. It sounds like this. Patter, patter, patter. I'm still in danger and my body knows it. I feel sight, sound and smell like a lifelong veil has been lifted from my senses. Because of this, I feel great. From that moment on, more than ever, Dan lived every day 
as if it could be his last. <coughs> We're down to the last toenail clipper and our wankling engine <coughs> is only running on goat's urine now. And he did a lot of things that were immature, but that, that wasn't what made him distinctive. It was these other ideas he had. The idea of approaching everything as if you're on this journey, making everything an adventure, even picking up a baguette at the supermarket. We're also now in possession of the baguette projectile. We've been issued with the latest chicken fire radio transmission devices. These moments were rarely undocumented. And I remember really clearly taking all these pictures. You do? Yep. But again, he like he put their names. He didn't, he didn't put my name on. <laughs> you are sort of a mystery man. I here. guess so. Because I remember one thing he said. We were on this. We're um, camping in the middle of the savanna. It's beautiful. And Dan was sitting there, and he's sort of waxing poetic, and he's like, you know, a great meal you can you can eat. You know, delicious food you can consume. You know, beautiful woman you can desire, but. What can you do with the landscape? You can't, you can't touch it. You can't take it. You can't kiss it. You can't, you know, you can't really possess it. But I think it also sort of explained his, his, his interest in photography was that, like, that was his only way of, of getting a piece of this world around him that so fascinated him. Filmmaker Rocco Bellich remembers Dan seemed to have a command over his subjects. Once, when his Land Rover broke down in a village, a woman appeared. His friends wanted to take her picture, but didn't dare. Dan walked straight up to her. And didn't say anything, didn't speak the language. Put his hand on her chin and moved her face a little bit to get the right angle for his picture and she did it, it's like the Jedi mind trick. What is the difference between exploring and being lost? Dan would spend his life searching for the answer. All through these pages, he's having so much fun, and it looks like this continuous party and stream of women and you know, <laughs> costumes, and it was all that. But at the end of the day, he always had a higher objective for good. He sold jewelry made by a Maasai woman trying to feed her family. He turned his house into a neighborhood disco to raise money for a classmate's heart operation. And at the age of 19, Dan concocted his most ambitious plan to lead a convoy across Africa with more than a dozen students from around the world to deliver aid to refugees in Malawi. Probably the most intense uh, coming of age experience that somebody could have. Just like, just like the door was burst open and here we were in Africa. They donated one of the Land Rovers and more than $17,000 they'd raised themselves, money that helped build water wells. He called it student transport aid. The whole thing isn't a sympathy thing, it's because the people, you know, it's, it's just great how they are. They're stunning and lively, even though they're in this terrible situation. You know, I never saw Dan doing anything normal. I never saw Dan getting a burger at a drive through You know, I never saw him in a classroom, you know, answering a question from a teacher. I always saw him, like, his feet planted on the ground in Africa, his Africa, leading, doing things, organizing things. And he just, like, glowed when he did that. You know, there's a way to meet somebody from a completely different walk of life that lives in utter poverty, that's never left their village, yet you can crack up with them. You know, you can throw your arm around them, you can dance with them, and 
you can feel that connection wherever you go to who, who, whomever you meet. You can just cut through those differences between people. And he did that just instinctively and got a thrill out of it. That's a big thing I take away from, from my experience with him. It is foolish and hazardous not to dance in Africa. What did you think of the journals, though, while, while Dan was growing up, when you were growing up? Did you just think, eh, they're okay? <laughs> yeah, I mean, they're, they're great, and obviously I was so proud of him, you know, and so proud to show them to people. Um, but, I, you know, I didn't know that they would make such a great impact on people. You had no idea. Oh, no way. And Dan had no way of knowing. One day, he would inspire thousands of people he would never meet. But to do that, Dan Eldon would have to encounter an awful fate. To Kathy Eldon, her son's story didn't end with his death. It wasn't because I wanted him to be famous or anything like that. It was just that I knew there, were mes there was a message to those journals that, that I had to get out. Annie Barrows is the editor of Dan's book. I had not ever seen anything like that before. He blew my mind. I'll always remember the day I presented it to the editorial board. <laughs> the editorial board consisted of a lot of men in their 40s. And I think when I presented it to them, there was this sort of melting of their faces in a way that I did not very often see. And everybody there acknowledged that these were astonishing visually, but that's not what made their faces melt like that. It was the idea that this person had lived so fully. I think Dan, for a lot of people, represents the path not taken and what we wish we were. And that's the power of the book. It's a power of example. That power was something that affected Gail Montgomery. I was in a bookstore. I got to the counter, and there sitting on the counter uh, was the Dan Eldon's The Journey's The Destination. So I said, I gotta get this book. Hello. Like Dan, Gail's documented her life in her own special way. That's actually one great. of my journals. Is and it really? Yes, it is. And oh, that's, what was that? That Gail? is, I, it, I found it on the road dead. No, uh, you're you, kidding yes, me. Yes, and I think it's someone's what? dreadlock. How about oh that? Oh my God, it is somebody's dreadlock. I know, isn't it fun? It's kind of creepy. Well, yes, but uh, I really Dan's journals gave me the gumption to do what my heart had told me I wanted to do so long. And it made me brave. <laughs> she worked in an investment firm for more than 20 years, but only ever wanted to do one thing, her art. come such a long way to be here, haven't you? <laughs> yes, and more, more than just miles. Gail lived in St. Louis, Missouri. After she saw Dan's journals, Gail quit her job, packed up a U-Haul, and moved to Taos, New Mexico, a mecca for artists, a dream she'd been saving for retirement. Isn't it wonderful? You gave up everything you knew just to be here. But I got to thinking about how short life can be. Look at Dan, he was 22 when he was killed. Okay, I'm almost 53 now. Who's to say that I will be here at a retirement age? And I wanted to have this joy of my dream now. 
When Gail arrived, she had no job and no place to live. And I'm not saying I wasn't scared. It was a little scary. Jason Russell is 24, an aspiring filmmaker. How was it? It feels good. Yeah? Yeah. Nice to meet you. He got Dan's journals as a gift. But here we are. I opened up through the pages and I couldn't believe what I saw. Inspired by Dan, Jason and two friends took off to Africa to fulfill his dream, to make a documentary film. What Jason discovered there was a story bigger than he could ever have imagined. Show me what you see that, that <laughs> changed your life. I see someone that had no fear in life. He was willing to take the risk that a lot of us aren't willing to do. What he, he has done to people through his journals, I think, has shown them that you can do it. Because when you are following your heart, only good things can come from that. Dan's inspired Gail's first show ever. And as a tribute to him, it's called Safari as a Way of Life. This is wonderful for you. I'm so happy for you. <laughs> Thank you. But once you see What does this show mean to you? It's probably the biggest event of my life next to the birth of my children. It truly is. And I know that there is no better measure of success that I have met you know, than this extraordinary person, Gail Montgomery, and I am deeply grateful to, to her for existing. So thank you. Dan, your journals just kick my butt. <laughs> In northern Uganda, Jason encountered thousands of children trying to escape their kidnappers a rebel army fighting against government forces. And they come every night to sleep on the streets because they're so fearful of being taken by this rebel army and used as children of war. It looked like the slave trade with just young children. I mean, the, the hard part for me is when they talk about, you ask them what they want to do, what they dream about, and they say, I dream of eating meat. I dream of, you know, having clothes. It's okay. Jacob, it's okay. Mm -hmm. The people who change this world are almost always viewed as crazy from the get-go. Like, you're crazy, you can't do that. You can't change and make um, blacks equal in this country. You can't, you know, sit in the, at the front of the bus, you know. But, um, but when, 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 once that one person makes that choice and says, yeah, I might be crazy, but I'm gonna do it, um, then, then there's change, positive change seen. And I knew that Dan's life was so um, extraordinary and so individual that, that I knew that that's what I wanted to do. He was a young man with bright hopes for the future, but they would never come to pass. Dan Eldon's dreams would ultimately end in a nightmare. It's Amy's 29th birthday, but celebrating is not something she's used to. Yeah, you know, 
for a long time, I never, I never thought that I'd really be able to laugh again. It's almost July 12th, 10 years to the day her brother Dan Eldon was killed. Dan's murder threw Amy and her parents into the darkest time of their lives. I tore at the curtains, I stomped and cried, and, and then I would be absolutely jolted into a sort of uh, rational sense of, oh my God, goodness me, my, my hair is dirty, I have to wash my hair. Nothing in my world made sense anymore, you know, that it was like the bottom had dropped off my world. The bottom didn't drop off, but their world did change. You know, I'm so proud of my parents now, looking back on that time, because there was such potential for them to be angry and to be vengeful. But instead, that anger mobilized them. Dan's father, Mike, opened a center for kids in Nairobi. In Los Angeles, Kathy runs Creative Visions, helping young people find ways to make a difference. And I grew up in Los Angeles, California, um, and my soul was always searching for more. And Amy's now a journalist. Dan ultimately was killed through vengeance and ignorance. And so now what we're trying to do is break down those barriers and cultural divides and that kind of ignorance that killed Dan. For Mike, the memory of a road trip he took with his son helps keep Dan's spirit alive. It's the most exciting time I've probably had with Dan. Maybe the most exciting time I've ever had. Just because of two good pals having fun together. Kathy's favorite memory is a simple one. And I would go sit and talk to him and it would be late at night, late, 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 and we'd talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And then I'd start to leave, and he'd say, no, 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 don't leave yet, just hold on. And he'd hold my hand, just come on, you don't have to go to bed yet. And just that, that sense of that there was so much more to talk about. And there really, yeah, there really is, the, you know, I guess when a dialogue is cut short like that, um, I wish I'd stayed longer, you know, I wish I hadn't been so busy. Personally, I wouldn't have cared if he never did anything inspirational because I loved him just for a nature of, of who he was and because he was my big brother and because I loved him. I was never worried about him in Somalia because I, you know, whenever there was a difficult situation, whenever we were in danger in Kenya, Dan would be the one to get us out of it. No way, man, that guy was going to be fine. So I never, ever, ever thought that he wouldn't come back. All his life, he flirted with death. Next, he would come face to face with it. Hello. I would like to welcome you on a safari from which you will never return. He would no longer be play acting. Soon, he'd live the real thing. This is Dan Eldon, Kit and Gala. Dan found his first job as a photographer for Reuters News. In July 1992, he was off to Somalia. Aidan Hartley was the journalist who took him there. I, I can remember the smell of the place. It was something about burning bone, uh, frankincense, dust. A year earlier, militias had forced out a dictator. Armed clans were now in control. When Dan and Aiden arrived, they witnessed one of the biggest famines of the 20th century and civil war. I think that uh, there, there isn't a, another example of a country in the world which had uh, so extraordinarily destroyed itself. In Somalia, the AK-47 has replaced the law. 
To arrive in Mogadishu is like falling into hell. But there was no question, Dan was going to stay. Well, you have to realize that he, um, he was an East African emotionally. Um, he felt uh, that East Africa was his home. Um, in a sense, more than most photographers that I met on the road, Dan really wanted to understand what was happening. By December 1992, U.S. Marines arrived in Somalia, hoping to end the famine. Instead, U.S. forces found themselves in a battle with one of the most powerful Somali warlords, General Mohammed Farah Idid. Dan always said that he attended Mogadishu University, studying how not to get your head shot off. On his first day on the front lines, he got a lesson. An angry boy pointed his gun at Dan. Dan pulled out his own weapon. And, and, and Dan took out a, um, a sort of plastic monster mask um, and, and put it on his head and stuck his tongue out. And it was such a extraordinarily um, a bizarre thing to do that the kid just burst out laughing. When I do get spotted taking a picture, the most important challenge is not to show fear. I try to look confused or pretend I don't understand a thing that's going on. But to get flustered is a recipe for disaster. Despite all the darkness, somehow Dan never lost his humor. No, this is not the beach. This is an area where General Mohammed Farah ID's weapons are being cantoned and exploded. And now I'd like to belly dance for you. Friends nicknamed him the mayor of Mogadishu. The new sheriff in town. I'm going to clean up this place. This was the day before Dan died in Mogadishu. This was the taking over of... Donatella Lorch is a journalist with Newsweek. Oh, he was very handsome. Oh, he was sexy. <laughs> Way too young for me, though. <laughs> On the side, Dan designed t-shirts and postcards. I always travel with my personal media crew. And they came in a package, you know, how when you're in Europe on vacation, you can buy a package of 12. Uh, well, same thing with Dan. This is the Kerber Somalia t-shirt, available in a wide range of colors. If you went on base uh, or to the press briefing, you'd always see all these guys running by doing their evening jog with Dan's t-shirts on. What news? What is? Um, have you heard of Associated Press? Because it's the European equivalent, sort of uh, only a bit better. <laughs> only a bit better. His pictures made the front pages of American newspapers and double page spreads in Time and Newsweek. Alison Fast is a photographer. He could climb into that quiet space inside of people and photograph their spirit at rest. The terror of being surrounded by violence threw me into a great depression. Before Somalia, I'd only seen two dead bodies in my life. Now I've seen hundreds. The worst things I could not photograph. I don't know how these experiences have changed me, but I feel different. He finally got sort of that dark side he was looking for. The hardest situation to deal with is a frenzied mob because they cannot be reasoned with. I've realized that no photograph is worth my life. My last conversation with Dan was, don't you think that you've been there long enough? It's getting really dangerous. Don't you think you should leave? And he said, Mom, don't ask me to leave. I have a job to do. So I said, okay, Dan. Drew a deep breath. You know, you're leading the life of your choice. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm really proud of you, you know, and I love you. And the line went dead, and he called me back a minute later, and he said, I love you too, Mom. And that was the last conversation we ever had. The Somali people he came to love would decide his destiny. For Dan Eldon, 
there would be no escape. You have to understand that um, we, uh, in a sense, felt that we were in an envelope of protection. You know, that all changed on July the 12th. A meeting of elders was in progress. Women were bringing in cups of tea, there were children playing in the yard outside. Sometime around breakfast time, a dozen Cobra helicopter gunships from the US forces deployed around this building, angled their guns into the building, and poured rocket fire, uh, cannon fire, and machine gun fire into the building for something like between 20 minutes and half an hour. The intention was to kill everybody inside. We know this because they uh, destroyed the stairwell so that people couldn't escape from the upper levels of the building. The US forces said they targeted the villa because it was the headquarters of the Somali warlord, Mohammed Farah Aidid. Aidid was not inside, but more than 70 people were killed. What happened was that the Somalis went down to the Al Sahafi Hotel and they said, come and see what the Americans have done. And so they went down there in a convoy of cars with Dan, Hoss Minor, Anthony Macharia, and Mo Shafi in one car. Cameraman Mo Shafi shows Dan's sister Amy exactly what happened that day. Here is when Dan said, uh, Babaji, are you afraid? And uh, I said, yes, I am. I said, why, why, why do you ask? He said, uh, uh, yeah, then he kept quiet for a second. And then I told him, I said, look, there's nothing to worry about. And uh, I'm afraid too. The journalists got out of the cars and went into the compound. I, Dan and uh, Anthony, we all moved in. They began showing uh, Mo Shafi, who was the cameraman, um, what was going on. At some point, the crowd, dismayed and distraught, um, and perhaps angered by the sight of cameras, turned on the journalists. These are the final seconds of footage Mo Shafi took before the first stone hit them. He then said, Babaji, let's get out of here. I can still hear his voice up to today. Just get out of here, run. And he began running and he was confronted by a man. The crowd parted. The man was holding an AK-47 and he shot Mo. With a gunshot wound to the leg, miraculously, Mo Shafi kept running. He then turned down the street. He was trying to find uh, doors to open, and a woman slammed the door in his face. He saw Dan and uh, Anthony running in front of him, and he realized when he saw a flak jacket lying on the floor that Dan had ripped off the flak jacket, and Mo said he felt happy because he knew that Dan would be able to run faster without the flak jacket. I think that uh, Dan was able to run quite a way. Perhaps he ran for a few minutes in the Mogadishu heat. And what we know is that um, a US helicopter, a Black Hawk, was hovering over the scene and, and saw this uh, European uh, Caucasian um, running from the mob. The pilot apparently radioed back to base, trying to find out whether 
a U.S. soldier had been left behind. Sabre base, this is Sabre 17. Any friendlies in this area? Over. Negative, over. He got message back from base that uh, all all soldiers had uh, had had returned. Confirmed. Negative pressure. He came down for one more pass over the scene, and by this time, the Caucasian figure was lying prone and dead. And then I just imagine his soul taking off, you know, his spirit just taking off and soaring like a hawk into the sky. Just soared, I don't know, he just... I'm sure there are five ways, ten ways, in which that pilot could have prevented it. And it is only after my son had been killed that he found it possible, presumably with his base, to land and pick up the dead body. That I am angry about. Pronounced dead at the 42nd Military Field Hospital at 12.45 hours, 12th July, 1993. The mob murdered four people that day. Hansi Kraus, Anthony Macharia, Ho Smina, and Dan. Mohammed Shafi was the only survivor. It was waste of human lives. I feel really sorry and hurt for the Somali elders and children and women who were inside that house who got killed. That, that was the reason why the locals were so much hurt. And I don't blame them at all. Maybe I'm alive today to tell you what has really happened. Maybe that was the reason God had wished. I, I truly could not believe it, but I knew it was true. To hear that Dan died, uh, somehow it, uh, it went against like my fundamental beliefs in the world. It was, uh, he was a guy who would survive anything and he was a guy I would stay in touch with my whole life and he was a guy who, uh, who I would know forever and I would see him change. And I remember going out that morning by myself at like 4 or 5 a.m. and just sitting on this rock and thinking about him and somehow trying to like commit myself to not forget what he stood for, forget what he did and to change my own life so you know no matter what I would have no regrets. They buried his ashes in the Engong Hills in Kenya. Safari, you know, I had this like Disneyland image of Africa uh, and safari. Keeping the natives at bay in big sort of pots of boiling water that you were sort of worried that your wife might get put into. And now I think of safari as, uh, as really what we owe ourselves, you know, the promise of who we can be. Safari as a way of life, I think, means taking away the glasses that have your filters and all your expectations of the things that should give you a happy life and, and let it happen in a kind of pure way, just kind of wing it. Dan had a particular record that he loved, which was Cat Stevens' You're Only Dancing on This Earth for a Short Time. I believe Dan would want me to say, you choose the music for your dance. You dance it loudly, you dance it proudly. And most of all, you dance your dance with love. Oh, very young, what will you leave us this time? You're only dancing on this earth for a short while. And though your dreams may toss and turn you now, they will vanish away like your daddy's best jeans, Dan of blue, fading up to the sky. And though you want them to last forever, you know we Will. You know we never will. And the pack 
she's made the goodbye harder still. Oh, very young, what will you leave us this time? There'll never be a better chance to change your mind. And if you want this world to see better days, will you carry the words of love with you? Will you ride the great white bird into heaven? And though you want to last forever, you know you never 